Welcome to the LinkedIn Live that I'm doing here today. My name's Mark Raven, and I'm going to do a short presentation today about learning from mistakes um, as individuals and as teams. I'd love to have you put in the chat where you are joining from today. I am in uh, the Dallas, Fort Worth, um, Texas area today, and, and hopefully we have people joining us from um, not just across the United States, but um, around the world. I, I, I hope the ideas I'm going to share here today are uh, applicable, helpful to you, uh, regardless of where you are. Um, so pictured here, you see uh, the books that I have written or co-authored, um, starting with the book Lean Hospitals, uh, published originally 15 years ago in um, 2008. And then coming through the progression, uh, my most recent book here, uh, the mistakes that make us, I, I think, builds upon kind of this this lineage of of lessons from Lean and other disciplines. Um, hi, Tim, uh, joining us from Indianapolis. Thank you for being here today. Uh, the mistakes that make us is, in in some ways, you know, maybe an introduction to Lean management for a lot of people that might not pick up a book uh, about Lean. Uh, for those of you who already know about Lean, I, I hope the book gives you some lessons and stories from Toyota and other organizations that are trying to continuously improve and to do so partly by learning from mistakes. So we've got people here from uh, the Dominican Republic, uh, from Istanbul, Lexington, uh, Kentucky. So thank you um, all for joining us. The topic of, of learning from mistakes is one that I've really I've taken a deep dive into for um, the last three years. I started hosting a podcast called My Favorite Mistake. First episode was, was released in September of 2020. Um, I missed the anniversary. I forgot to signify it or celebrate it in some way, but uh, three years of the My Favorite Mistake podcast. Today, I just released episode 230 with Ken Snyder, the executive director of the Shingo Institute. So I hope you'll check that out. You can go to mistakespodcast.com. Um, uh, we've got people joining us here from uh, UAE, San Francisco, Nigeria, Egypt, Toronto, uh, France. Um, so it's really amazing to, to have all of you here today. So again, I'm going to be presenting a little bit. We're going to do some Q&A and discussion after um, the presentation. So a happy third birthday and anniversary to the book uh, to the podcast, my mistake. See, I'm going to I'm going to make mistakes and acknowledge them. That's okay. Um, the podcast is three years old. The book is about three months old, and that book is the mistakes that make us. It's available now um, in in paperback and hardcover print editions. Amazon Kindle, Apple Books, Google Play, ebook stores, and it's available as an audio book through um, Audible and. Apple Books. So I hope you'll check out the book and you can go to mistakesbook.com to learn more about that. So as I'm demonstrating here today, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. I, I, I find it helpful to call them out and to, to acknowledge them, whether it's to myself or to you as an audience or uh, to people I'm working with or others. Acknowledging the, the, a mistake is sort of, you know, just recognizing the fact that the mistake happened. It doesn't mean that we have to shame ourselves or that we're setting ourselves up to be shamed. I think just acknowledging the fact that, look, we're all human. We all make mistakes. I think that's healthy. And at least for me, that's helpful. I've made more of a habit of that of just calling out, hey, I made a mistake. I was wrong. Uh, my bad. However you want to put it, we all make mistakes. So maybe think about a mistake you've made already today. You know, it's one o'clock Eastern time, halfway through the day uh, for some of our um, attendees and, and morning for, for some of you. Um, then maybe it's just a chance to reflect. What mistake have you made today? And then we're going to talk here about how we might learn from our mistakes. So what is a mistake? I mean, the, we, we know this word, but one way of defining it is an action or a judgment that turn out to be misguided or wrong. Emphasizing the key words here, turn out to be misguided or wrong. Um, I made a small mistake. I didn't need to underline the space between the word out and to. It, a mistake is an action or a judgment that turns out to be misguided or wrong. We can only determine this 
with some amount of hindsight. That could be seconds, it could be minutes, hours, weeks, years. You know, we, we make a decision or we take action or we choose not to take action at a particular moment in time. We think that's the right decision or the right path based on the knowledge we have, the assumptions we might be making. And as time goes forward, sometimes we, re we, we might realize, well, we made a bad assumption. Or an assumption gets replaced with data or information. And it's okay. It's a sign of strength to admit a mistake and to, to change our path forward as opposed to stubbornly doubling down on the mistake. Denying an, a mistake doesn't make it less real. Right? It's there whether we want to acknowledge it or not. So when we think through a mistake, and um, you know, there's a comment here in the chat, uh, mistakes help us to learn. We I, I'd say I certainly hope so. Um, making mistakes, is, uh, Tim Clark, who, who gave an endorsement blurb for my book, Tim Clark, the author of a fantastic book called The Four Stages of Psychological Safety, in his blurb basically said, you know, uh, making mistakes is not a choice. The way we react to them is a choice. Learning from them is a choice. Individually, we can choose to embrace this. And then when, once we get into a team, it gets a little bit more complicated. But if we can first try to admit mistakes to ourselves, we can try to think through them using some reflection questions. And I'll give credit. Um, I, I learned these questions from an organization called Value Capture. Helpful reflection questions to think through, what decision did I make? What did I expect to happen, right? So when we make a decision, we, we, whether we're stating it formally or not, there, there's a hypothesis of I'm doing this, I expect something good to happen, or I'm choosing not to do something because I expect something positive to happen. But then we step back and say, well, what actually happened? What's the gap? And then most importantly, what do I learn from the gap? So we, we detect the mistake by some gap between expected and actual outcomes or performance. What would I do differently? Right? Instead of blaming others or blaming circumstances, and you know, this might not be all on us, but I think it's it's helpful, and my podcast guests really illustrate the idea of, of asking, well, what did I do? What did I decide? What can I do differently in the future? And what would I expect to happen? So I think there's, there's an opportunity to learn, um, not to dwell on it, not to beat ourselves up, but just to walk through questions like this and, and think about how that might help us. So on an individual level, we can try this out, whether we think through it, whether we write it down, um, I think this is helpful. But then within a team, I think once we get more than a couple people involved, or maybe even two or more people, learning from mistakes in an organization, I think requires two key components. They both start with the letters PS, as it turns out, or I, I forced it uh, to be that way. Psychological safety, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a minute. The safety to speak up, the safety to admit a mistake plus problem solving, right? So just admitting a mistake in and of itself doesn't mean that we have the skills or the practice to do, let's say, some root cause analysis and think about what we would try differently. What experiment are we going to run going forward? What different experiment than the one that we had previously tried? But in a, in a team, if all we do is give people problem solving training, but they don't feel the safety to speak up to admit a mistake or to point out a problem, we can't do any problem solving without admitting that we have a problem. So we looked at Toyota as an example. Their internal publication, 2001, famous publication called The Toyota Way. In that document, it's, it's reported to say, we view errors as opportunities for learning. And there are great stories in the podcast episodes in the book from people like Asao Yoshino, who started his career uh, in Japan with Toyota in the 1960s, and my friend David Meyer, who started with Toyota in Kentucky in the late 1980s. 
Viewing errors not as an opportunity to punish somebody, but as an opportunity for learning. And when we learn, we can improve. In the book Toyota Culture, co-authored by Jeff Liker and Mike Hoseas, it says, in terms of this holistic way in which Toyota looks at, at safety, it involves providing for the physical and psychological safety of each member and their families. It's an intentional value that drives subsequent action. That's the ideal. Does Toyota live up to that ideal every moment of every day? Probably not because they're a company made up of humans and, and we're all imperfect and we all make mistakes. But having these cultural intents around saying we are going to learn from our mistakes and, and to not repeat them, I think is a great first step. Then we need to make that ideal reality. So what is psychological safety? This this is a phrase that gets thrown around a lot and, and sometimes gets misunderstood. Psychological safety is defined well by uh, Professor Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School, author of uh, a great book, The Fearless Organization. I'll give a shout out to her most recent book out in uh, the, the past month called Right Kind of Wrong about learning from mistakes. Amy Edmondson says, <clears throat> psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated. So I would add, we could use words like a feeling, a perception, right? Each individual decides in a team, in a workplace, how safe they feel based on the interactions they've had with other people. It's a belief that we will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with things, including ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. We can't learn from our mistakes if we're not able to speak up about them if we don't feel safe speaking up about them. So when we learn from mistakes, though, I think it's worth acknowledging not all mistakes are created equal. There are some mistakes that we might call preventable uh, mistakes, things that should not happen if, you know, we, we know how to prevent them through good standard process. And if people are able to follow that process, the error or mistake won't occur. So we can think about medication errors, wrong dose, wrong drug, wrong time. Those are preventable, even though we have the element of human error involved. And when, when people say like, oh, well, there's always going to be human error. What can we do? That We need to answer that question, right? What can we do in terms of good systems, good processes, good culture, good leadership? Don't just throw your hands up and say, well, it's going to happen. We need to work to prevent them. But then there are other mistakes that are happening kind of on the frontier of improvement or innovation. If a team is trying to make some changes um, to workflows and communication in, in a surgery center with the intent of improving the patient experience, hopefully reflected in patient experience scores, if we try something and there's a hypothesis, if we do these things, waiting times will come down patient experience scores will go up. And we try those things and it turns out to not be true when there's a gap, if that's a quote unquote mistake or a failure, we can't punish that, right? Punishing mistakes leads people to either hide and cover them up. Punishing people for their attempts at improvement will, will make people be very cautious. We'll have less improvement, lower performance. So we can try to prevent mistakes in different ways. Sometimes the best we can do is a procedural attempt to prevent a mistake. That could include checklists, whether that's in an airplane cockpit or in an operating room or in running a webinar or a podcast. I have checklists that I use, but here's the key. You have to use the checklist, right? You have to, um, you know, the, the, the checklist doesn't magically prevent errors. It's the rigorous, disciplined, consistent application of the checklist that can prevent errors, of not getting cocky and saying, well, I haven't made this mistake in a while. Uh, I'm going to stop using the checklist. That's when you get burned. And I, I know that from firsthand experience. So instead of punishing mistakes, we do more to prevent them. But then when they happen, it's really important. Oh, that was my mistake. We were talking about times when we can actually mistake proof um, something. This can be more effective if we can actually physically prevent somebody from typing in, let's say, something that's not a valid phone number into a phone number field on a form on the web. 
We can use mistake proofing to prevent, for example, you cannot put the diesel fuel nozzle into an unleaded gasoline vehicle. It will not fit. That mistake is mistake proofed. The opposite, not mistake proof. You could put unleaded gas into a diesel uh, vehicle, which, which ironically is even more damaging than putting diesel into an unleaded. But um, you know, we, we have to rely on, on not just telling people to be careful. We want to um, use different systems and, and methods to prevent mistakes. But then when they do occur, here's the transition that I was intending to make, we need to use small mistakes to prevent big ones. We, we don't want to just react to mistakes that had a really bad outcome. Mistakes that didn't really lead to any harm for a patient are, in fact, our best opportunities to learn. These, these events are more frequent, and when we learn from them, we can prevent mistakes that have a huge impact. So one example, again, from healthcare, Dr. Greg Jacobson, who's an ER doctor, CEO of Kinexus, you know, shared this example with me, and it's in the book, uh, The Mistakes That Make Us. Let's say um, you know, a patient, the, the intent was to give 600 milligrams of ibuprofen, and they were, uh, the nurse was about to give an 800 milligram dose. There was a mistake. It was caught, and, and even if that medication had been given to the patient, probably wasn't going to cause any harm, wasn't going to be fatal. But the risk when somebody says, well, okay, good, we caught the mistake, let's, let's just move on, that's a lost opportunity for learning. The, the failure mode, if you will, in the processes that even allowed the wrong dose to almost get to the patient, that same failure mode, if not addressed, if we don't learn from that near miss mistake, the same failure mode could lead to, in the future, a harmful or fatal medication error. So there's this, this need and this opportunity um, in different settings to use small mistakes to prevent big ones. So a couple of thoughts will wrap up and then um, we'll take some questions and, and hopefully have some discussion here. To me, reacting constructively to mistakes is kind of a progression that we can go through here. The punitive reaction to mistakes it says it's bad, it's counterproductive, it's unhelpful, it drives mistakes underground, it probably dooms us to actually have more mistakes over time when we punish mistakes that have happened. So some organizations move forward beyond this punitive reaction, and, and they are what you might call nice. It's better than being punitive. This is where leaders you know, say things to people like, well, it's okay, I know you didn't mean to do it. Um, it's not your fault. We're not going to punish you. Like there's this focus on making the person feel okay. Or even in some settings, a nice response might include not pointing out the mistake because we don't want someone to feel bad. But we don't want to be reacting nicely to the same mistakes over and over again. Like being nice does nothing to prevent future mistakes. It might help someone speak up or to continue speaking up about mistakes, but that, that's not really problem solving. So I think better, um, I'll, I'll color code it green, if punitive is bad, if nice is better, but not fully helpful, a kind reaction that's more action oriented. You know, it might be a little challenging, it might be a little uncomfortable to point out the mistake, but we can help somebody move forward from the mistake by taking action to understand how that could have occurred, what we could do to prevent it, what we're going to do differently moving forward. So I would encourage leaders, um, don't shift from being punitive to being nice. It's not about being easy or soft on people. It's about being kind and constructive and focused on preventing future mistakes. So we need to cultivate a culture this takes time, it takes nurturing, we can plant the seeds for a culture of learning from mistakes that can grow into a culture of continuous improvement. We don't implement a culture, we don't buy a culture, it's not like installing a piece of software, it's, it's like a garden. Uh, it's something we really need to nurture and keep growing over time. So if this has been interesting, I, I would encourage you, if, if you're not already, please follow me here on LinkedIn. Please check out the podcast, My Favorite Mistake please check out my book, 
the mistakes that make us. And so with that, I'm going to I made another mistake in the spirit of time. I'm going to put up the slide with additional contact information um, and um, a general thank you. So I would encourage people um, attending, uh, you know, uh, if you've got any questions or comments, go ahead and put those in the chat. I want to welcome people here from Bangladesh, from Ghana, the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, somebody else uh, from, from Turkey. Um, there's a question here from Alfredo. How can I invite you to my podcast? Um, send me an email, mark at markgraven.com. I'd be more than happy uh, to talk to you about that. Um, here's a comment um, um, I'm going to put on screen here. Uh, I think this is insightful from um, Ahmed. It says, time, time changes. Uh, maybe in the past I didn't consider something a mistake, but after being you know, a wise person, I consider that now to be a mistake. So yeah, sometimes look, the passage of time, new information, new perspective, um, we might now you know, say, well, that decision I made years ago was a mistake. But I, I, again, I think my advice would be instead of you know, dwelling on that mistake or making yourself feel bad about it, you know, think back to those questions around um, what you learned, why you made the decision that you made, what played out differently, what decision would you make given that same opportunity again, you know, focus, focus on um, the learning. Um, we've got people here from um, Chile and Brazil. Um, comment here, good presentation. Thank you, Pedrag. Um, another comment here, every mistake is a new way to learn how things can be done better. That is a fantastic summary of uh, what I hope I was saying, because I, mean, I think that's, that's the key, right? Again, don't just think about the big mistakes with the huge impact. The small mistakes can be just as helpful of an opportunity to learn and improve um, and to grow. And I think not being dismissive of saying, like in the, in the example of that medication error, well, it's just a different dose of ibuprofen. What's the harm? What's worth digging into? Like, well, there's, there's maybe a lot to actually dig into. Um, so, you know, feel free if you have other questions or comments, um, just some other comments along here to air as human. Very, uh, another comment, very true. Everybody makes mistakes. The mistakes help us to learn. And I, I'm, I'm hoping to help people make that more of the reality, right? You know, I mean, we can learn from mistakes. That doesn't mean that it's guaranteed. So I'm going to leave the line open here. If there are other mistakes, I'm going to hold up a, a copy of uh, the book here. The Mistakes That Make Us, you can order it um, through Amazon around the world, um, Apple Books and other retailers. Um, if you're in uh, the US in particular and you'd like to order a signed copy, or if you would like to do a bulk purchase for your team, uh, you can learn about doing that at mistakesbook.com. We have someone else attending from Saudi Arabia. Hello, thank you for being here. Um, here's a comment uh, from Larry Brock. I'm gonna put up on screen here. Uh, Growth comes from self-reflection. It requires humility and honest self-appraisal. I think that's that's a great way of, of stating it. Um, when you look at you know, the, the Toyota culture and I think their attempt at, at, at having a culture of continuous improvement, having a culture of psychological safety and learning from mistakes, they talk a lot about um, the need for humility. Um, there's, there's a great book. It's on one of the bookshelves behind me here called Toyota by Toyota, written by um, Daryl Wilburn and Sammy Obara and others. You know, chapter one talks about humility, Kaizen or continuous improvement and challenge, right? And I think when we acknowledge a mistake, um, we, we can challenge ourselves in a constructive and positive way, you know, to learn, to prevent a recurrence and to, uh, to keep going. Um, there's a question here. How can I manage uh, a small mistake? Well, I think, you know, those reflection questions that I put up earlier um, can, can be helpful. We can use other problem solving skills um, to try to um, get to the root cause of a problem. But uh, again, you know, I'll share this um, for people who join late. I think these reflection questions are really helpful for a small mistake or a big mistake. What decision did I make? 
What did I expect to happen? What actually happened? What do I learn from the gap between what I expected to happen and what actually happened? What would I do differently? And what would I expect to happen in the future with different action, hopefully driving different results? Uh, there's a question here, how can I learn from others' mistakes? Well, um, we have to help other people feel safe to admit their mistakes in, in different ways. You know, on, on the podcast, on uh, the My Favorite Mistake podcast, I'm forever grateful that I have, at this point, 230 guests and, and some other episodes that have been recorded, um, episodes where, where people have been kind enough to share mistakes they made, which, you know, there might be circumstances where listeners could learn from that particular mistake and not, not repeat it themselves. But I, I think there, there's kind of, you know, the, that demonstration of um, sharing, you know, when successful people are willing to share that they've made mistakes. I hope it, re it reinforces this idea that, again, we all make mistakes. I don't think people are successful because they made fewer mistakes. That might be true in some cases, but I think what's more likely is they are successful either in spite of mistakes or they're successful because they've made mistakes and learned from them, right? That's where I think the frontier of innovation and improvement uh, comes from. Uh, Mahmoud asked, would it be possible to get a copy of the slides? Um, yes, I will do that. I will put a link later into the comments and, and you can always email me, mark at markraven.com and I will send you those. Um, Ed Pound, hi Ed. Um, comment here, science advances through mistakes. Eureka is not the usual venue of discovery. Rather, it's looking at the data that doesn't support your hypothesis and seeing something wrong. And then the comment, hmm, that's interesting, yes. Um, and I think, you know, when we are trying to be more experimental improvers in, in a continuous improvement culture, we plan, we do, we study and adjust. That's not a linear implementation, it's, it's a cycle, right? We plan, we do, we study. I think the humility and challenge concepts would, would have a say, well, we, we, we're, we're testing a change. Right? We're not implementing it because we know it's going to be effective. We're testing a hypothesis. Um, we study the impact and we leave open the idea that we could be wrong or that we, we don't get the results that we um, predicted. I, I think that's a healthy habit um, moving forward. So um, as Ed, thank you for the comment. Great exploration of mistakes, Mark. A good path um, to discovery. Um, uh, where can we get the mug? Hi, Joni. Um, the mugs, I mean, we can figure out a way. I, I don't really have a merchandise shop uh, for the podcast, but uh, if you email me, mark at markraven.com, we can figure out um, how to do that as a one-off. And, and, and the mug has not just the podcast logo here. And thank you for that question, uh, Joni. Like, to me, this is the more important side of the mug, and I intentionally hold it up as reminders uh, to myself, I'm, I'm gonna read it here. Um, be kind to yourself. Nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes. The important thing is continuing to learn from our mistakes. A couple of mantras there that I think are helpful. So Joni, if you wanna email me, mark at markraven.com, um, we can figure out something uh, around uh, a coffee mug and my autofocus has gotten thrown off my mistake because I was holding up a mug to the camera, so. Blurry, Mark Graven here. Um, uh, then a uh, comment from Larry, maybe we'll, we'll wrap up here soon, um, saying this is a great topic, doesn't get talked about uh, enough. Uh, I believe it was Thomas Edison, and, and this is said to be true. Um, I didn't fail 10,000 times, I learned 10,000 ways um, that didn't work. I think that's a, a healthy mindset, but you know, at the same time, you know, I'm not accusing Thomas Edison of taking this approach. You know, the, the fact that we can iterate and that we can learn from improvements doesn't mean, you know, we can just kind of wildly try things or, you know, throw spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks, if you will. I think a good plan, do, study, adjust cycle for continuous improvement means we think through, make sure we understand our problem or our situation. We think through different possible improvements or countermeasures. 
and, and, and there could be debate, there could be discussion. When we have psychological safety, as my friend Jim Benson put a smiley face emoji in there, hey Jim, let's say Jim and I are working on something and we feel uh, a sense of psychological safety with each other, Jim can disagree with me. Right, he can challenge my idea. He can propose, uh, propose an alternative, and and I and psychological safety means I'm I'm open to that, and we can hash it out. Maybe we, you know we try something different than I was originally thinking, or we we try a couple things in parallel, study, and then hopefully we're able to honestly and candidly evaluate the results based on um, how things actually play out. Um, we have a comment here, um, just says LinkedIn user. Uh, what are your suggestions for teams that struggle to create a culture of psychological safety? Um, I would recommend, um, I think in particular, Tim Clark's book, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety. Um, his website, leaderfactor.com. Like they, Tim, Tim Clark and his team do a lot, so many free podcasts, free webinars. Um, ways to learn about psychological safety. And, and I quote and cite um, Tim in my book, uh, The Mistakes That Make Us. Um, but I, I think we're trying to create psychological safety, like key things that I've learned from Tim Clark, you know, for one, what not to do is tell people they should feel safe, right? It's just ineffective. If a leader says things like, well, this is a safe space, you should feel safe. Like, well, people will decide on their own how safe they feel. And, and people will realize if, if leaders aren't walking the talk. So it does work, and, and, and this is from Tim Clark's research, um, different cultures, different industries, different environments, is for leaders doing two things. I'm gonna put up a slide um, that I had skipped here. You can improve psychological safety, and it mainly starts with leaders. Sometimes this is peer-to-peer -peer within a team modeling what Tim Clark calls vulnerable acts, right? So speaking up in a way or taking action that could be perceived as risky or dangerous or creates the risk of harm. So speaking up to admit a mistake in a low psychological safety environment is very risky. It is very dangerous. So to help counter that and to help build or cultivate psychological safety, I think it's very helpful when leaders model these behaviors when leaders admit mistakes, when leaders say, I was wrong, or even when a leader says, I could be wrong, so let's go test that idea, that's really powerful. It gives people permission to think about following their lead. Like, well, if the boss admits mistakes, it may, the boss can encourage people. The leader can encourage people. I want you to admit mistakes, but then here's the key. You have to reward those vulnerable acts. Right, so there are these two key pieces I think leaders lead, leaders go first, model these behaviors. And then when people start to follow your lead, you need to not just tolerate it, you need to reward it. And I don't mean handing people money, but I think rewards include sincere thank yous and positive, kind, helpful uh, responses. Okay, so with that, we're, we're about 30 minutes in. I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up, but I'll, I'll make one uh, final plug, encouraging you or inviting you to um, check out the podcast, My Favorite Mistake, and um, to check out the book, uh, The Mistakes That Make Us. It is available in uh, print books, ebooks, audiobook, different formats, different retailers. Um, you can learn more at mistakesbook.com. Um, the podcast, um, a little more than three years old now, you can learn more about it, uh, mistakespodcast.com, or you can search your favorite podcast app. So I hope you'll check it out. If you have um, follow-up questions or anything, please, you know, you can post comments. If you're watching the recording, post comments, and I'll try to go in and post some replies, or you can email me, mark at markraven.com. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for the thank yous. Um, and um, really appreciate, all, appreciate you all taking the time to be here as I wrap up with a mistake and stumbling across my words. But there we go. That's okay. I hope this was useful. Thank you for being here.